What's up YouTube? In today's video, I'm going to show how to build some pretty advanced interactions inside of Webflow. We're going to add in these different menu interactions, slider interactions to your actual Webflow projects. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I have our basic section set up for our project. Um, one thing that you are probably noticing is that all the links on our site have a text color of blue. And that's one thing that I've always had trouble with in Webflow is that you have to apply a color to your links um, to make them not blue, but then you'll have to be adding extra classes whenever you have a dark section on the page and need to reverse it. So I actually found this code pretty recently that really makes things a lot easier. All we have to do is type A, which represents link, and then open up our brackets and set the color to inherit just like this. What that basically does is make the text color of the link inherit from its parent, but we can still override that color at any point we want by using a class. So we'll basically use that setup since we'll have a darker menu but lighter page body, and we'll use that for our links. The next thing we want to do is basically have some sort of slider. So I have this section with uh, control for a slider, but I also need to have a container inside of that section because if we look at our basic design, we have these three card sliders and we want them to fall within our actual container borders right there. So I'm going to give this div a class of container and it has a little bit of padding using EMs. I'm using the wizardry method, uh, which you're more than welcome to look that up on my channel if you'd like to learn more about that. I'm gonna add a combo class of slider to this and zero out the top and bottom padding so that way our slider basically just doesn't have any padding in this section. Now this slider is going to be dynamic and I'll be using something called Splide. Uh, Splide is a really nice slider that works with EEMs, viewport widths, and max width containers. So all the scalable units that we've been using. I'm basically going to drag a div inside my container and give this a class that needs a very specific class of Splide, just like that. And then inside that, I'm going to drag my collection list since this will be a dynamic slider and I'm going to pull that collection list from the case studies collection. So the wrapper needs a class of splide uh, underscore underscore track, just like this. The list needs a class of splide underscore underscore list. And then finally, the item needs a class of splide underscore underscore slide, just like that. And then we can go ahead and set the list to flexbox and then it can be the same height and justify left. We want there to be three items inside our container. So we'll set their width to 100 divided by three uh, and then add a percent sign to the end of this. So each item should be exactly a third of the container width. Um, you'll see they're all being squished because they're in a flexbox. So we need to basically set their sizing to don't shrink. Uh, so that way they're exactly a third. Um, and we'll set their height using EMs for now. Actually, I can probably pull that from my design. Their height is 804 pixels high. We're on a 1920 wide frame. So our frame is 1920. I'm using the wizardry calculator here. We said the height of our item is 804. And that means that their height in EMs is this size right here, which it copied for me. I can just paste that in there. Um, and then we'll drag an image inside here as well. So I'll just drag an image tag. And this one uh, can give any class, but I'll call it splide uh, image. And then we'll set its width to 100% of the parent height, 100%. Uh, we'll set its fit to cover. And then we'll get the image from our CMS right here. Um, and let's go ahead and set the order of our collection list. Um, I'm just going to sort it alphabetically by name. Uh, and then we need a little bit of space in between our actual slides. So if I look in Figma right now, it's 20 pixels. I'll have padding in each item, so I need half of this gap right here. So 10 pixels, um, I'll set right there. And then I can set that as the padding inside my collection item, left and right. And then that 10 and 10 on both sides will give me the full 20 gap that I need there. And we're getting some horizontal scroll. So in every one of my projects, I like to drag in a div that contains the whole page and give it a class of overflow. And basically that has a width of 100%, overflow of hidden, and position of relative. And then every section on the page goes inside that to disable over, um, horizontal scrolling. So when I have this circle that's positioned or some of these elements hanging off the edge, it's totally okay like that. 
um, and that's looking pretty good there. So the next thing I'll do is I'll leave the code uh, in the description of this video, but basically we just want to copy all this code and we want to paste it in the closing body tag section of our page setting. So right here, and you'll notice it uh, also gives us our own controls to click next and previous. So this control right now is just a link block uh, with Flexbox and I have this uh, SVG inside. I'm using this variable of current color so that way when I change the color or the text color of the parent right here, it's also changing the color of the arrow inside. Um, what I'm going to do is set up an interaction where I want a control uh, fill color inside here. So I'll say uh, control uh, fill is the name of this class and we'll basically give it a position of absolute to the top right corner of the entire link block and let's give it a width of 100% a height of 100%. And let's go ahead and set its background color to this navy right here. Um, we'll give it a Z index of one. And so that the arrow is on top, let's give the arrow a Z index of two. Um, so we have this basic fill color here. What we can do with that is basically use some negative margin. So like negative 100%, we'll pull it off the side right here. Um, and let me also give it a radius of 50% so it rounds it like a perfect circle. So I'm basically going, going to have this sort of slide in and fill up the circle just like that, which means the overflow of this parent control needs to be set to hidden. So that way we're cropping off the circle inside it. Um, so I'm actually going to set this to negative 100% and then this one will be negative 100% as well. So it's right off the corner and we'll slide it in from the center just like that. Um, and that should be what we need to set up our Webflow interaction um, on the press state right here. I'm just going to go ahead and scale it down 0 0.9 uh, with a little bit of a transition on this. Um, that way when I press and hold it just shrinks down a little bit and we'll do the rest with Webflow interactions. So let's come over here, create an element trigger of mouse hover, apply this to the class so we can have more than one. Start any animation and we'll call this control hover in. And let's basically grab the fill color right here, that circle that we have off to the side, set up in a move, set this as an initial state, and we'll move it 0% and 0%. We want it to stay right where it is right now. Our second action though, we'll move it over, um, I wanna say negative 100% here, yep, and then down 100% here, so that way it slides into view. You'll see it sliding in on that angle there. Then we want the arrow to be light so we can see it. So we'll grab the link block and remember it's affected based off the text color, which is originally purple for our initial state. And we'll change it to pink for the second state. So now that slides in, the arrow changes to pink. What you might notice, uh, it might be hard to see, there's a little bit of a, a outline around this because the fill color isn't completely covering up the circle that contains it. So what we can do is set the entire link block to a purple background color just to sort of hide that. So it'll be transparent at first, and then we'll change the background color right here um, to purple. And then we don't want this to happen right away though, so we'll delay it 0.4, so that way it doesn't happen until this thing is almost completely slid into view, and we'll make it take 0.2. It can be really quick, something like that. That way the background color fills in after the circle is slid into view. And let's give it a little bit of easing. Out cord is fine. And that's super smooth, looking great. Uh, let's set our hover out. We'll just duplicate our hover in right here. And we'll rename it hover out. And we'll delete our initial states. And the first thing we want to happen is the background to change back to transparent. So that way we can see the circle sliding out. So this will have a delay, a zero second delay. And these will have a 0.1 delay, so they uh, start to happen after the background is changed to transparent. Uh, this uh, text color of the arrow needs to change back to purple, and this move right here needs to go back to zero and zero, so where it started. Um, and then let's just go ahead and preview that in Webflow and check it out. We hover in, hover out, that's working perfect. Um, so let's go ahead and duplicate this control to make one more of it. And then let's add a class to this arrow of is, uh, we'll call it flipped like this. And we can basically use that to set a transform that rotates it and flips it back over that way. 
perfect. And then these need specific classes. If you remember from our custom code in here, um, it has a class of next slide and previous slide. Um, that way it knows that these are clickable for the slider. So add a combo class of next slide to this one. And to this one, I'll add a combo class right here of PRV dash slide. Um, and that appears to be working. Now, inside our Figma design, we do have this sort of SVG wave, and we want that to cover the entire width of the screen, meaning that even when we get past our max width container, we still want the actual um, wave to span the full width of the entire section, not just of our actual container. So if we look in here, our container uh, is going to be right there. What we could do is drag some waves outside of the container, but inside the section. Um, so we can do that by dragging an embed. I'm actually going to use an embed for these SVG waves outside of the container. And I need to get the code right here of the SVG wave. I just opened up an SVG file in a text editor to get this. So now I have that wave, and actually it needs to go in this section here. Um, I can give it a class of slider wave. And what I want to do, because it's right here, you can't see it, it's the same color as the background. We need to position it absolute to the top of the section, which means the section needs to be position relative. And that way we can set the wave absolute to the top like that and give it a Z index of two so it's on top of the other stuff. And then what we can do is actually just duplicate this wave. I'm going to go back into normal view for a second and let's add a combo class to the second one of is bottom and let's drag it underneath our container and let's basically position it to the bottom of this like that and we're going to need to do a transform again and rotate it and just flip it upside down like that um, and then we're going to need our controls see it's not lining up because our controls are position relative so it's not lining up with the bottom of the container Let's set our controls to position absolute as well. And there are three, so they're on top of that. Um, and that appears to be working uh, right there. I think we have that basically set up. Let's just publish this and test it out. So on the live site, we have all our items. We can click and it's going next, it's going previous. We can also click and drag and it's an infinite loop either way. I'm getting a little bit of offset on this. Uh, you can see a little bit of the image peeking out underneath this wave. So what I can try and do is a little bit of negative margin. Yeah, and that would do just fine. Um, negative 0 point, uh, maybe 6 viewport width. And the reason why I'm using viewport width for this instead of EMs is because on larger uh, screen sizes, this wave keeps uh, scaling up infinitely with the viewport width. Um, which means I need to do the same for this top one, negative 0.6 viewport width. Give it a little bit of negative margin there and there. Um, and that is looking pretty good. I mean, that's our basic setup. What I may do, because at certain sizes on larger screens, this is getting really tiny, these images. Um, what I could do actually is give the slider a min height of our EM value, so it always stays that value, but the height could be based on viewport width. So uh, 40 viewport width and I mean that way on most screen sizes it's still maintaining a reasonable size and then once it gets down here our min height is the thing defining the value right there so that way they don't get shrink and get too small uh, they stay pretty much like our design um, and that appears to be working looks good here and then we can zoom out and looks good here as well. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is set up our basically custom cursor. So I'm going to drag in a div here and give it a class of cursor. And I want this to be on top of my nav. So my nav has a Z index of 900. I'll give this a position fixed uh, to cover and give it a Z index of 1000, uh, width of 100%, height 100VH, and then flex will be to center it. And then we'll drag a dot inside that cursor. So inside the cursor right here, we have cursor dot one, I guess we'll call it. And in our Figma design, 
It's basically this tiny little thing right here. It is six pixels. Because it's so small, I'm gonna use pixels for this to make sure it doesn't get too small. Um, and then for the radius, it's 50% to make it a perfect circle. And then the background color is this purple. And then we need the second dot, so I'll duplicate this one. And then I'll duplicate the class and make this dot two. And then for this one, what we're basically going to have, let's see, is 52 pixels wide. Um, so we can go ahead and change the width here, 52 and 52. Uh, we won't have a background color on this one. We will have a border though of two pixels purple, just like that. We want it to be on top of that circle, so we'll switch its position to absolute. And that's working pretty well. Um, I can't click on anything underneath this cursor because the cursor is overlapping everything. So whenever I try and click on the slide, it's just clicking on this cursor. So I'm gonna have to copy the class of that and head over to my embed. And I'm going to have to make this not clickable. So I can add it to my pointer events none code right here. That just basically makes the cursor not clickable. And now I can click on everything underneath it, uh, which is working pretty well. So let's go ahead and create our page triggers. We want one circle to lag behind the other one. So we'll create a mouse move and viewport. And this will be for our first one. So we'll call it a uh, circle or we'll call it uh, cursor one. And what we want to do is select the first dot and we'll set up our basic uh, interaction. Um, so this is going to be applied to the class. It'll be negative 50 viewport width for this one, uh, positive 50 viewport width here. And then we'll set another move on this one, which would be negative 50 VH. And this is positive 50 VH. And so let's apply this to the class. So now if we preview, you'll see it's directly following my cursor and I'll make it lag behind by giving it a smoothing of 82%. Um, and then we need to create one more page trigger, mouse move and viewport. Um, and this one will be for cursor two. And then this time we're going to select the second dot and we'll set up a move interaction. This will be negative 50 viewport width to 50 viewport width. And then in here we'll do negative 50 VH again to 50 VH. And let's just apply all these to the class. Let's just select them one by one. Perfect. And then let's make this one lag behind. Uh, we'll do 90. And let's preview. So now the smaller dot is moving faster and closer towards the cursor. So the next thing we need to do is basically whenever we hover over one of these slides, we want to change our two cursors from this style to these styles here so we can reuse our exact same Webflow interaction that we built. Um, we're going to do this using classes. Uh, we're seeing the size of this cursor is 158. So if we just put 158 into wizardry, that'll give us the EM value it needs to be. And we're going to be adding combo classes to this. So like this dot, for instance, would have a class of is larger. And then we could use that to define its width right here and its height. Um, and then we'd also change maybe its background color like this. Now it's also going to have text inside of it. So we can drag in a bit of paragraph text and maybe make this say uh, drag. And then we can copy that text and it needs to get pasted inside of cursor.2, which means cursor.2 needs Flexbox to center it up. Uh, and we can give the text a class of cursor um, text would be fine for that. Um, so we don't want to see the text at first. We can set the overflow to hidden and maybe the text color to transparent. That way we don't see it. And whenever we add the class of is larger, we'll just set the text color to pink. That way we can see it again. And we're using the CSS transitions applied to width, height, background color, and text color. So that way it fades when we add and remove the class instead of just snapping to that. We can do the same for dot one. We're basically going to add a class of is larger. And then what we're doing for this is changing the width using EMs. So we need to get the EM value we copied here and paste that in. And then we'll do the same for the height. Um, and then we'll change the background color to this light pink this time on dot one. 
um, and then this one is dot two is larger. Okay, so we have those two. Basically, we want to add those classes of is larger whenever we hover over, let's say, the entire collection list. So we can actually use the wizardry jQuery builder here, and we can say on hover. So this uh, works for hover in and out if we use the hover option. And then we're targeting the class of our collection list. So whenever we hover over the collection list, we want to find an element. The element we want to find is this cursor dot one, um, and we're going to paste that in as our target class. All we want to do to it is toggle a class on it, and the class we're toggling is the one we created in Webflow called is larger. So the first time when we hover on, it'll add this class. Then when we hover off, it'll remove the class since we're toggling it. Um, we also want to do that to dot two. So I can add another action down here and say dot two, and we're adding that same class of is larger. Then we can just copy all this code it generated for us, and it needs to go in the closing body tag section of our Webflow project right there. Um, so we can go ahead and save and publish this, and let's just test it out on the live site. Um, so on our live site, we hover over, and that is working just how we would expect. One dot is trailing behind the other. It changed the style of the two, and they're like growing into that size. We found us having to create a brand new set of elements. Um, one thing that I did notice is see right here when I'm on the slide, it's not showing me uh, to drag until I go down a little bit further. The reason for that is this embed is covering up a little bit of the image underneath. So what we really want is only the SVG path inside this embed to be clickable. And then we want all this empty space right here to not be clickable. That way it accounts for that. So I can copy the class of this uh, entire embed. We don't want the SVG inside. We only want this path, the actual shape of the wave to be clickable. So we can basically use our HTML embed down here and we're going to target our class and then we're targeting the SVG inside that embed and then we're targeting the path inside the SVG. And all we want to do is set the path to pointer events auto, which means it is clickable, but then we'll just add the actual class of the entire um, embed to be not clickable, pointer events none. So we can see this is working because whenever I hover over this uh, piece of the wave, it highlights the uh, actual embed. And whenever I hover over this part, it highlights the image. So it's switching between the embed and the image, and that is working just fine. So now, if we test it out on the live site and refresh, what we should notice is our cursor is highlighting over the right part, hitting the edge of the wave, and it works even down here because the, both the waves use the same class. And then we can still drag and we can still click. Um, we're also going to want whenever we hover off of the page, we want the cursor uh, to basically just disappear. So 0% opacity. Um, so what we can do is set its initial state in CSS like this to an opacity of zero and then just show it whenever we hover over the body or the page of the site. Um, let's also add a transition to the opacity. That way it fades instead of just snapping and we'll open up our embed. And then what we're basically gonna target is the body. So the whole page and we'll add a colon and do hover. So anytime we hover over the body, we wanna find the class of cursor, which is our div that holds both the dots. And we wanna set its opacity to 1.0 which is full opacity. So now notice in Webflow, when I hover off the page, no cursor, and then when I hover on, it fades into view. So it's fading in and out right there. Um, so now whenever I hover off of the body on the live site, the cursor is just going to completely disappear. So hover on, and then I hover out, and it goes away. Um, and that is working just fine. So whenever we hover over this trigger element too, we basically want the same cursor to show up, this uh, larger one, just so we know it's clickable. Um, so what we could do is open up our code embed, and then in here where we said, anytime you hover over the collection list, basically show the two larger cursors, we can add another uh, class to this by hitting a comma, a space, a period, and then pasting the class name of our hamburger icon or the trigger. So now this same interaction will work for both of these the collection list and the trigger. So let's go over to the live site and test it out and we'll refresh. Um, so now when I hover over this, it says drag. I hover over this, it says drag as well. Now, whenever we hover over this one, 
instead of saying drag, we actually just want it to say open. So we're going to have to change the uh, words of this a little bit. Um, so what we could do, we can actually use the jQuery builder for this as well. So we'll copy the class of our trigger. We'll come back over to our jQuery builder and we're going to say uh, this time on hover in instead of regular hover. On hover in of our trigger, we want to get an element and the element we're going to get is actually the text that's inside of our cursor. So this cursor text um, right here. And then we're going to replace the text inside of it. So by default, it said, um, I believe it said drag. So this time we can change it to say open. So we can copy all this code and we can basically just uh, paste it down here. And let's indent that middle line just so it's easier for us to read and keep track of. And then let's go ahead and save this and publish and test it out on the live site. Um, so this is the first step of what we need. So when I refresh, here it says drag, and then here it says open. If I come back over here, it still says open though because we never change the text back to say drag. So we're also going to have to create a hover out. And this is why we did them as separate interactions of the trigger. We'll replace the text back to say drag whenever we hover off. And then we can copy all this bit of code and then come back over here and then we'll just uh, paste that in right there and indent that middle line and then we should be good to go. So we should have our two uh, cursors working whenever we hover over here, over here and back here. The text is changing for us just the way we would expect and that is looking great. All right, so our last step is really to add some nice interactions to the menu. And whenever we open the menu, we want this big sort of wave to come down, fill up the screen, and then come back up. So I actually created somewhat of a Lottie animation that I'm planning to use for that. And it just fills up and then fills back out. Um, so what I'll probably do is we have the menu. Um, I'll set it to display block so we can see it. Um, it doesn't have any background color. For now, I'll just give it um, a background so we can see what's in here um, and then we have the container since we want this wave to span the full width of the entire screen not just the container I'm going to keep it outside the container um, and basically I'll just drag it inside the menu and we'll give it a class of background and we'll position it absolute to the menu itself uh, to the top it can be a width of a hundred percent um, a height, I'll do 101% for the height, and I'll show why in just a second. Um, and then let's drag our actual Lottie uh, in here. And this is going to be background, uh, let's call it background Lottie. Um, and then let's give it a width of 100% of its parent. Um, so this Lottie needs to be at the bottom, because if we preview it, you'll see it fills up and then fills out. But our menu is going to be different heights depending on the browser height. So we need another div above this Lottie to fill up some of that empty space that the Lottie doesn't fill up. Uh, so to do that, we'll drag another div inside the background. We'll call it background uh, fill. And then we'll give it a width of 100% and a height of 100% of its parent and a background color of this uh, purple. So right now it's filling up the entire parent, but if we apply Flexbox to the parent like this and do vertical and stretch and top, now it's filling up the remaining space of the parent minus the space of the Lottie, which is at the bottom. So if I preview that Lottie, you'll see it's filling up and then it'll fill out just like that, returns to a flat line. Um, so then all I really want to do when my menu opens up is basically just uh, move this up maybe like negative 100% so it's out of the way and then we'll slide it the whole thing back into view and then we'll have the Lottie playing at the same time so it gives it that illusion that it's moving down. Um, so let's also make sure, let's see what our container has a Z index of two. So let's give this a Z index of one to make sure it's underneath the container. Um, and then our entire menu interaction happens whenever we click on this trigger. So if I click open nav, uh, this interaction right here, what I'm basically going to want to do is set the initial state of the menu. Actually, that needs to happen instead of to the menu. We need to make that happen. Um, let's delete that from the menu. We need to make it happen to the background itself. So just the background piece is going to move. So we'll do the same thing, negative 100%. Um, and that will be our initial state and then we'll move it again 
uh, this time to 0% uh, move, and then again out sign, and then we'll do 0.7, um, and then we'll grab the Lottie that's inside here, and we want that to play, so we're going to start the Lottie at 0%, and then over here we'll play the Lottie um, probably to about 50%, so it's like halfway, and then we'll basically set a duration of 0.8, so it's a little bit longer, and out sign, so we have this nice move right there. You'll see the Lottie isn't completely touching the fill, like there's a little bit of a gap right there. So let's do a negative margin of 1%. Uh, That'll make it overlap it just a little bit. Um, and that should do it for us. So if we preview, open the menu, you'll see the Lottie falls down. And then we need to set up the close interaction as well. So whenever we close the nav, what do we want to happen? Uh, we basically want to grab the background again, and then this time we're going to move it uh, back up. So negative 100%, um, duration will be 0.7, and then the ease will be out sign, and then the Lottie will just basically take the Lottie, and we'll play it till almost the very end, 99%, um, and then that's going to happen over 0.8 again, and then we'll do out sign. And then we need to end the Lottie where it started. So right here, this can have a duration of zero, but we just gotta bring it back to zero where it started. So that way this whole interaction can repeat. Um, and then we can remove that background color that we applied to the menu. We don't need that anymore. And we can set the menu to display none for a second. And let's test it out. So we open, and then when we close, it slides back up. Perfect. All right, so the next thing I want to happen is for each one of these links to stagger in whenever we open up the menu. And if I open it right now, what you'll see is each one of these are wrapped in a link block that has overflow set to hidden. And inside that link block is a container. So I, I guess I'll have to move it down with transforms. Um, let's try this. So see, it's just being cropped off because of the overflow hidden. So I can just uh, have it start out of view and then just slide it up into view. And I can do the exact same thing for these links because they have a contain right here that's inside of a link block that's being cropped off. So I can just move them out of view and slide them into view. Now, if we were to do this with uh, Webflow interactions, it would take a long time because uh, we got to do the same thing for each one of these links one by one. We'd have to add a bunch of combo classes. And if we ever add a new link, we would have to edit our Webflow interaction. So I'm actually just going to use AnimeJS because it's going to be a little bit cleaner um, way to do this. So I'll leave this code in the um, description of this video, but let's just copy it and we're going to paste it uh, basically inside our closing body tag section. And what it's doing is it's looking for a class that we want to push down and then fade up. And in that case, my class is this nav link contain. Um, so it will basically stagger these one after the other. So I'll just paste that class name in here. And I'm also going to pass in these sublink contains as well. So that way we can loop them all into one. So I'll just separate it by a comma, space, period, and then the next class name. Um, this is going to happen on click of the trigger, which the trigger is this piece right here. And it looks like it also has a bit of a delay. Uh, so 3,000 milliseconds. Um, so I'll make sure that I basically fade these in with a Webflow interaction first before queuing up that stagger. Um, and then let's go ahead. We're going to have to check it out on the live site to see, but we can set this to display none and publish, and then we can test it out. Here we go. We open up the menu, and each link staggers out one by one. I can close it, open it again, and it just keeps repeating the process of each link just staggering in one after the other, and that's perfect. Now, if we were a little further down and we open the menu, we'll see a little bit of space down here. We don't want that to happen. So what we're going to need to do is whenever we click on this menu, we want to scroll the user back up to the top of the page. Uh, so we're going to give this embed, since it's at the top of our page, an ID of top. And then we'll make our trigger link to the top section right there. Um, and that will basically, if we were down a little bit and we click, it'll scroll us up, so that's perfect. But we can still scroll up and down, and we don't want that to happen. So we're going to have to add a class to the body. Um, and the class we can add is overflow hidden. 
If you've ever added overflow hidden to your body before and then checked it out on the live site, you'll notice that you can't scroll at all uh, whenever overflow hidden is set to the body on the live page. Um, so we can just add this class to the body whenever the menu is open. All we have to do is use the jQuery builder and we're going to say on click of this trigger, which is our hamburger icon, get the body and then toggle a class. Um, and the class we're going to toggle is the one we created of overflow hidden. So the first time we click on this trigger, it'll add this class. The second time we click on the trigger, it'll remove the class. And that's exactly what we want. So we can copy all this code and it needs to go in the closing body tag section uh, with our other code down here. And instead of targeting the class of body, we'll remove that period and just target the actual body element. That way we don't have to add a class to it. Um, so now if we come back over here and publish, we can check it out on the live site. Um, so let's refresh. Um, now if we're scrolled down a little bit and we click, it scrolls us up and disables the scroll. I can't scroll up and down anymore, but if I close this, now I can scroll up and down again. So that is working just fine. Um, let's also go ahead and set just a couple little hover states on in our menu right here. So I'll open this back up. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is set this on the nav links. So whenever we hover over a link, we wanna show an image like a 3D uh, GIF that I exported from Spline. Um, so I basically have this image inside each one of our nav links right here. If I set it to display block, you can see there's a bunch of them animated back there. Uh, so what I'm gonna wanna do is basically create an uh, interaction anytime I hover over this nav link. We'll do uh, mouse hover and we'll apply this to the class and we wanna target every nav link, not just the first one. And we're going to say nav link hover in will be our uh, link right here and the first thing I'm going to do is get this line and I'm going to set its width so if I uh, do size right now I can basically set its width to 0 em as an initial state right here and then I'll increase the size to maybe 5 em so that way this line just sort of slides out um, just like that and then we'll also get the image and we'll set it under initial state to display none and then we'll do uh, display block. This image is inside the link block and position absolute. It's only going to do the children with this. Um, so only the one that pertains to the link we hovered over. Um, and I may even add a bit of scale. So by default, I'm going to make it scale down 0.7 or something like that. And then whenever we show it, it can scale up to one, um, something like that maybe. Uh, that could be our hover state. And I'm trying to think if we want to do opacity with this. We'll just do the scale for now and we'll set it to out sign. Um, and then for the link block, let's set that to, actually let's just set them both out, like to out port. Um, and let's see how that looks. So it slides out, pops up. Yeah, that looks great. So then we're going to basically duplicate this for hover out. We'll duplicate this and rename it hover out and what we want to do here is delete all our initial states and we'll set the size back to 0 em uh, we'll set the scale back to i believe 0 0.7 is what we had and then after all that's over so i'm going to pull this one out uh, we'll set the image to display none and now we can go ahead and preview this um, so we'll open the menu we hover over a link that scales up Perfect, that one scales up. Um, we're probably going to need to change the opacity of it though, um, so that way it fades out. Um, yeah, we're going to need to add opacity in here with this one. So we'll do opacity of zero, and we'll do out court on that one as well. And then for this one, we'll grab the image and we'll add opacity to this of 100. And then right here, we'll do opacity of zero and do out court or actually we need to reverse this one so this is opacity 100 and the initial is opacity zero all right let's try that now okay we hover in perfect all right so we can see these and that appears to be working just fine we got these 3d sort of things rotating in the background and our line is writing out last thing we can do is basically make an underline appear under these sublinks 
So there should be an underline in here already. It's right here and it's basically being moved over negative 100%. So it's just being slid out the way and because the parent has overflow hidden. Uh, we're not actually seeing it. Um, what we can do is grab the sublink and we basically want to do a mouse hover and apply this to the class. And we can call this one uh, sub hover in. And we want to get the line that's inside of this. Um, and we'll set its move and use an initial state here. By default, it's going to be negative 100%. And then we're going to move it like this to 0%. So it's completely in view. So we'll just leave this part for now. So it's just going to slide in. We'll set this to out court for that one. Let's preview how that looks. That looks good. Um, let's set our hover out. So let's go ahead and duplicate this. And let's name this one um, hover out. And basically what we want to do is move this um, over 100%. So it's over that way. And then let's move it back um, negative 100% to where it started. And let's set the duration on that to zero afterwards. Um, so now let's go ahead and preview this. We open this up, hover over a link, hover out, and then it just keeps doing that endlessly, sliding from one to the other. All right, and that is looking great. We have that set up and it's looking great uh, for those links. If you've enjoyed this tutorial, feel free to subscribe so you never miss out on another video. Also, feel free to check out my Patreon page. Usually around the beginning of the month is a great time to sign up and join the Patreon community. I have more advanced tutorials on that page, so feel free to check that out. I'll catch you in the next video. Goodbye.